pierced my, my sense. I, I, uh, when I visit schools, I like to meet with kids before I do anything else. You know, 25 kids for breakfast. And I'll ask them if they know how Google works. Every kid says they do. Every single kid. And I've only met two who do. Out of thousands. And then I show them how Google works. And, and they, they just can't believe it. That they didn't, they thought they knew when they didn't know. I would rather the kids know they don't know. Because then they might be questioning because they, they know they don't know. But because the kids think they know, they're not asking for help on how Google works. Do they? And people who don't know what they don't know, I think, are more dangerous than people who are fully aware that they don't understand something. Uh, so I'm still having trouble. Um, let's see what I can do here. You know, uh, do you see November Lane? Maybe this will work. And so I'm really worried that we have a lot of kids using Google. And the research shows that something like 85% of kids are using Google for homework. And uh, they only look, the recent research I think I read said, well, the majority of kids only look at the top screen of results. And the majority of students, when they start with one search engine, they do not change search engines, even if they need a different search engine. This is like starting with the dictionary, and then you need a thesaurus, but you don't know there's a thesaurus, so you just stick with the dictionary. Because that's all you know is this one reference tool. And then, of course, my own research, my own little research, strongly suggests that kids do not know how to track the ownership of content. If you ask them, where did it come from? What's the source? Their strategy set is typically weak. If what I'm telling you is true, then what we've done is we've created the conditions where it's becoming easier and easier to manipulate people with information. So I don't want to be right, but I think I am. So the conditions, um, okay, so here, I'll, I'll play a game. Sometimes, I haven't done this for a while. November, hit search. Wikipedia is number one, and uh, remember Broadway. November learning, I, I'm, down, I'm down there. Oh my god. It used to be number two or three out of a billion. I, I just want to show you that the total number is a billion, and, and, and I'm in the top screen of results of a billion. You're hard to impress. <laughs> How did I do that? Billion top screen. In fact, you could do something, some of you right now, to help me climb in the result order. So what do you do? Let's start with the easy part. What do you have to do? I'll pay you. What do you, what do you have to do to get me up above? Link to me. That's right. But those are, why are you here if you know that? So you go to your website, your blog or something, and you type in the word November. You have to type in the word November on your website. Then you highlight it and make a hyperlink to my website. All right? Because what Google is doing is it's looking for the word November anywhere in its directories. And as long as it finds the word November on any website, it looks to see how many links are coming into my website from other websites. You don't see the links coming into a website. A human being <clears throat> by yourself, you can't see that. But the search engines see that. They see all the links between websites. 
And that's, that was the magic of Google. That's what shot Google ahead of every other search engine when it was invented. No other search engine did that. No other search engine looked at all the links between websites. So, if you think about it, Google, Google's algorithm is based on popularity. It's a popularity contest. Whoever has the most links coming into their website from other websites around the world basically is going to be ahead of a lot of other stuff when you type in those keywords. Did anyone understand what I just said? Because I don't think I explained it well in the morning. Uh, and further, you can see, okay, that's one, links coming in. And then, and then Wikipedia, of course, the word November is in the web address. I'm sure most of you know this, so, but we'll go over it anyway, because it's important just to start with the basics. And then November the play, and the word November is in that web address, and uh, the word calendar is there. Anyway, the word November is in mine, and so and there's a word November in that one. And so what Google does is if the word you use in the search bar is in the web address, that gives you more points. So you're up at the top. You'd be amazed at how many kids don't know what I just told you. Two, two simple little things. And of course, Wikipedia, we have lots of schools, like the one my children went to, who tell the children not to go to Wikipedia because it's not a reliable source. Anybody can type in anything at any time, so you really shouldn't be going there, which means all the children go there right away. That, 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 that doesn't work as a prevention, that works as an enticement. And uh, so you might want to tell them why uh, Wikipedia is at the top of almost any search. And you know, you probably know this too. If I go to the Wikipedia article, Wikipedia takes the title of every article, in this case, November, and it uh, puts it in the back of the web address automatically. It's every single article title is at the back of the web address. And for those of you who might not know about the structure of wikis, each page has its own web address. Each article has its own web address in a wiki. That's just how they're organized. It's important to know that because that's why Wikipedia is at the top of almost any search. If you happen to take the title of the article, chances are you're going to find Wikipedia in the top 10 over and over and over again. So that's what I would, because the dominant answer kids give me about why information is at the top of a search, I just ask them. They say it is the most important information. And I look at them and I say, no, no, that's not it. And they say it's the most recent, or it has the most hits, or it's alphabetical, or it has the most reference to the word, or, oh my god, I just start making it up. <coughs> when kids don't know something, I think they just make it up. All right. Uh, by the way, just out of curiosity, how many of you come from a school where you're pretty confident that you have established a web literacy requirement for every child, like in reading, and that every child graduates being able to tear the internet apart layer by layer. How many of you have established this requirement? Ooh, nobody. Nobody. See, given the workshop's easy, implementing, very, very hard. And this is going to sound arrogant or, or dumb, I'm not sure which one. Sometimes I don't know. Uh, I've been giving this workshop since 1998, what I just showed you. 1998, 12 years. I must be the only guy in this conference given the same workshop. I bet there isn't another presenter here who's giving the exact same workshop they gave in 1998. It's me. I'm the furthest behind but I'm going to do it until the country establishes a requirement 
that we can't send children out in the world where the internet's the dominant media without understanding the architecture of information. It's essential. Okay, next bit. So that's just the beginning. I'm sure most of you knew that. And uh, off we go. That's a boring. It's boring, you know, but you have to do it. And uh, now, I should give you a problem. How many of you are on the web right now? Good. I'm going to give you a problem. Real problem, very serious actually, quite serious. So, but I think serious problems will make you work harder. A woman came up to me not long ago and she told me that her doctor, well actually it's a friend. So a friend of hers came up to her and the friend's doctor told her not to go to the internet. She had been diagnosed with breast cancer. And the doctor told her that she would be overwhelmed if she went to the internet. And there'd be too much information. And some of it would be outdated. And some of it would be from pharmaceutical companies trying to convince her for their chemotherapy to tell the doctor. And he said, look, this, I'm your doctor. I'll take care of you. You know, and he meant well. I'm sure he meant well. But he just told her, do not go to him. I'm sure he tells all his patients. So she went to see her friend, who's a teacher. That'd be you. And she knows you have internet in school and class, and she says to you, I'd like you to help me only find high quality results around the most recent research in breast cancer. Go ahead, conduct that search now. Tell me how you do it. Help your friend. Because at one point, everyone is going to be desperate for high quality information. And most doctors do not teach their patients how to find the best quality information. They do basically what schools do. Don't go there. That was cruel, wasn't it? Don't go to Wikipedia. Okay, so you, you design your search, and uh, let me, are you done? Do you have it? Do you have it? Um, here's what I would do. You, you, you compare yours to what I do, and see, you know, and I don't know that I'm right, I'm just going to do a bunch of different things. So, in fact, the doctor's right. If I were only to type in breast cancer and do a search on breast cancer, I get 44 million results, and the whole top is sponsored, sponsored breast cancer, sponsored links. Um, so these people pay. You do understand that if I click on this one, Brigham and Women's, as soon as I click on it, they owe Google money. And, and the bidding for the phrase breast cancer today is probably somewhere between three and five dollars a click. So Google is making money every time you click on a sponsored link. That's how that works. And so the doctor's right, 44 million. That's just an amazing amount of stuff. And so what I do is I type in breast cancer. And then we're going to type in, uh, now the, by the way, Medline Plus is at the top because I've been searching for it. Um, and see, I've, I've gotten to it a lot. So it's moved it to the top of mine. But um, did you get Medline Plus at the top of yours? No, no, probably not. And in any case, down here, if I go to the San Mercury News, 63 related articles, there's Wikipedia, of course, for reasons that we now know. The word breast cancer is in the article title. Uh, .com, Mayo Clinic, National Breast Cancer Organization. So the way, what I would do is I would just say site colon uh, gov. And at that moment, when I hit search, my results are only government sites because site is a command that holds results to one extension, and the one extension is GOV. I, I picked that, GOV. So all of these results are GOV, they're government sites. 
And uh, so government sites are very different than pharmaceutical companies. All of these are government sites. And in fact, the, the medline keeps showing up over and over again. In this way, just to show you, July 13th, 2010, uh, Medline Plus, it happens to be the National Library of Medicine, which I didn't even know existed. I, I didn't know that existed. See, I bet some of you might have gone to the Mayo Clinic or a hospital you know, and, and that's because you have some knowledge. But imagine you don't know anything about a problem. You don't know anything. You don't have any site you're actually looking for. You're just starting a search in something you know very little about. At that point, I think you need strategies for high quality information. And holding your extension, that's very powerful, potentially. And if I go to the Medline Plus, the library, then uh, it gives me, in fact, the most recent research and news by the National Library of Medicine, which is July 13th here. So I don't know how many of you did that. Uh, that's one strategy. Another strategy might be, uh, instead of GOV as an extension, you might decide that EDU is a pretty good extension, higher education, did search, and in fact, now I've got Stanford, um, and Cornell, and Cornell, and UC, Sloan Kettering, uh, University of Michigan. Uh, and you can see as I scroll through this, Stanford again, those are pretty good sources. That's university teaching hospitals doing research on breast cancer because I held for the extension EDU. What did you do? What, how, any other strategies? You had success? Yeah? You went to timeline and put in one year, but then you would have gotten pharmaceutical companies. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, that, not, that's not what I'm doing. Yes? And that's not to say pharmaceutical companies don't have valuable information, but it wouldn't be my first. You understand? Yes. Was a hand back there? Yes. I went to Google Scholar. You went to Google Scholar. Yeah, you can go to Google Scholar. Except, as you understand, with Google Scholar, there's a, there's a delay in things being published by scholarly reviews. So it's very good if you're a researcher, Google Scholar, and uh, and I understand that. And that, that's actually interesting. Scholar.google.com would be another strategy. And you can type in breast cancer. And actually, I haven't done that, but we can do that. And take a look to see what these dates are. I have to go in there since 1987, 1995, I, I don't, 2002. I, I don't know. I'll just have to go in and, and take a look at that anytime since uh, 2010, include citations. Um, and so 2010, clinical analysis of post-operative radiation. So you're only going to get things that have been scholarly reviewed. But in the case of medicine, there's typically a delay in getting scholarly reviewed where the National Library of Medicine would not have that kind of delay. But it has its usefulness, there's no question has its usefulness. Another strategy? Yes? I did in um, most, recent, most recent research in cancer. And then I also, I'm sorry? I typed in most recent No, you can't do most recent research because the article could have been written in 2000 that says most recent research. <laughs> but then when I scroll down, I'm very selective in what I look at. And I always pick um, .gov, .org, or .edu. That's what I tell them. Yes, them. but still. <laughs> Type in most recent research. Google doesn't know what those words mean. Those are just letters lined up. Do you, it has no value, most recent research. OK, you go ahead and do it, but I'm just telling you, it, it's not the way a search engine thinks. It's the way a human being thinks. 
and the way you think doesn't count. It's a search engine. Do So you have to think like a search engine, not like a human being. You're too smart. Google's not smart. It's dumb like a refrigerator. The, do you think it knows that you're in front of it when the light goes on? It just turns off. Yes, but if you type in most recent research, an article doesn't have that. In it, in it, and it is the most recent research, then you've lost the most recent research. Don't argue with me, young lady. <laughs> Sorry, that was rude. <laughs> but it is my conference. Okay. All right. Uh, all right, so, well, you'll decide. I can't, you know, I'm just trying to convince you that, that this is the better way. You'll decide. You'll decide. How about this side of the room? They're winning. Of course, now you know I'm mean and cruel, so you're not going to Okay. Yes. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah, the same workshop since 1998. I think I'm giving the same exact workshop because we don't test for web literacy. I think this country basically only seriously takes curriculum if we have a test for it. The day that No Child Left Behind in the various states decides that the internet has become the dominant media of society and that we ought to be teaching children the architecture of information, its very structure, Every teacher will be teaching because your superintendent will say, we've got to get our test scores up. You get that web literacy stuff into those kids' heads. Boom. Done. But until the day comes when no child left behind decides it's going to be a test or the SATs or we, we won't take this seriously. No, that's my opinion. That's an opinion. This is not rocket science. This is, I thought this was going to go in two years. I, I thought when I started doing this, this was so important to the children not be, but oh, the other thing that happened is schools that had to filter because the federal government, we decided the best way to protect children is to filter them. But the only place they're filtered in the entire world is in school. Meanwhile, they go home, unfiltered, Starbucks, unfiltered, go to the university, do the, and filtering, in my opinion, is an incomplete, if not misleading, policy. If that's all you're doing. And so why we allow filtering to be the policy of protecting children drives me crazy. So there's two forces preventing us from doing it. Filter, that's it, we protect the children, and we don't test for it. Regardless of the moral, Question, should we teach children critical thinking in the most powerful media ever invented by society? To me, it's a moral issue. Brian, is that a good moment, or should we get that one? Ah, I love this. Okay, I've invited Brian Sheik to come, because he has a cool tool called Yolink. How many of you use Yolink? Oh, you're going to, this will impress you. Do you want, yeah, this, this is a cool tool for cutting through into the content. Now, one of the problems while Brian's getting set up, do you agree that children typically only look at the top screen of results? Yes. Go ahead, you watch them. Yes. Now watch what Brian, Brian's tool Yolink can do, and some other, and he's doing this cameo unprepared, although he does, he's seen Yolink before. Um, but thanks for being here. Thanks, Al. Can everybody hear me? So the show of hands was not too many, right? Who's, who knows of Yolink? No, who, you, well, who uses it? Who uses it? And how many have introduced it to students? Oh, that's a good thing I'm here. OK. <laughs> um, so to categorize Yolink first, um, Yolink is not a search engine. Um, so we're not in a 
another Google, we're not another Bing, another Yahoo. Um, YoLink is a browser add-on or a browser application that you download onto your computer. <coughs> Um, both Macintosh and PC, um, we work in three browsers, Internet Explorer, Firefox, and Chrome. Um, we will soon bring the um, add-on to Safari, but as of now, we don't support Safari. So if you're on a Mac, you've got to be Firefox. Um, when you uh, download the product, it shows up um, like on Alan's computer here with a, with a little um, Yo icon. And so the, uh, the idea is that if you, are looking at, if you are looking at a set of links, which we are always looking at links on the internet, whether we're on Wikipedia and we're looking at a bunch of embedded links in a page or any website that has a bunch of links <coughs> like a news site, or if we're looking at a list of links from a search engine, uh, the idea is, yo, you know, use your link on these links. So it's like that next level of search that you can now manipulate links and search links via key terms and extract content in context for what you're looking for. So let me use a, uh, an example that I try to use um, often. I have one of those uh, lazy high school students um, <coughs> 10th grader, last year was doing some history homework on the couch while we're watching a hockey game. And uh, he asked me, um, Dad, do you remember if the um, Coolidge and Harding presidencies benefited the farmers? <laughs> and I was like, well, Trevor, I'm watching Sidney Crosby, so uh, I don't remember right offhand, but I had the laptop open and I said, why don't you, why don't you try? and see if we can find it you know, on the internet. And I said, why don't you, you know, use YoLink? He's like, oh, you know, yeah, 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 YoLink. You know, here I am, I'm, you know, work for the company. YoLink's been out for a year, and I can't even get my son to you know, try to, because his time span is, you know, like this. So um, we did this, and we typed into Google uh, Coolidge and Hardy and Farmers and Benefit. So the first thing YoLink does is it does help students understand key terms. Like a lot of kids would just put in, you know, did the farmers benefit from da 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 da. So um, one of the things that uh, we hope YoLink does with uh, with students is, you know, you don't need to, to do that, and you can um, oh, that type of thing. Uh, <coughs> Um, so the first thing it hopefully does is teach uh, students how to um, use the right type of key terms uh, to get the best results. So um, now that you're faced with you know the never-ending list of you know two million results, and the students think that that first page is the authority, um, now let's use YoLink. So when you oh, that's, yeah, I'm sorry. so when you click on the icon of uh, YoLink, it will present itself as a, it'll drop in as a sidebar into your browser. And if you're using the top five search engines, whether the top five, they're top five by use, which is, um, you know, Google, Bing, AOL, Ask, Yahoo, we'll auto-populate the same terms um, into the YoLink search box. You can change those terms and search these links for other words so you can iterate your search, you can leave them the same. Um, but what happens is um, we're going to search these links and we're going to best keyword match and we're going to click on find. So when we do this, what happens is that the YoLink technology is going to go behind all of those links, those 10 that are on the first page, or if you're looking at a website with 200 links, it's going to go through them all. It's going to go behind those links and it's going to search for your key terms. And it's going to bring back content in context with your key terms highlighted. So now you can go through the long list of results. And as I hover over a paragraph, you can see that we actually tell you what link that information is coming from on the right. 
And so I told my son, look, um, you know, what color is farm, you know, these are all Coolidge and Harding related, but, you know, what color is farmers, oh, farmers is blue, you know, what color is, you know, benefit is, I think, green will be the next color, <coughs> benefit. So I said, why don't you look for some paragraphs with green and blue, benefits, farmers, you might find your answer. Um, so that's, that's one thing. Uh, key terms highlighted, content and context to try to, because what students have a problem with is opening and closing tons of links and then they get frustrated and then they jump on Facebook, right? <laughs> so this keeps their attention, right? Because they're actually seeing information <clears throat> coming back to them. The other um, great thing with it is the ability to go deep into search results very efficiently because I can come down here and say, let's go to uh, page four of Google, and we'll jump to page four of Google, and we'll go through the same exercise. So a lot of um, education websites with great content, they don't know uh, SEO or search engine optimization, which um, you know we're talking about how you get the links up to the top. So there's, you know, here's some great, this, what student would get to page four of Google? highly unlikely. So this enables them to review a lot of content in a short period of time very, very fast. So you can get deep into search results um, very efficiently. Um, so that's, uh, that's the first kind of um, value add of, of, of Yolink is uh, manipulate links. I could, I could then look at some of these things and see different terms and I could change my search terms and, and research those links to, to show other information. Uh, the other uh, things that we've done with Yolink is to provide a lot of integrations with uh, a lot of your other favorite tools that you use and your students use every day in their life. So um, if you've noticed, um, all the uh, results have a little uh, checkbox next to them over here. And uh, we have a little uh, toolbar across the top which enables you to do certain things. And you can <coughs> universally check all the results off with the, with the top level checkbox or the student can go through and say, well, I really like that paragraph and um, this one looks really good, I like that one. So you can go through and as you're collecting your research, you can check certain paragraphs and then you can um, share it. So these are all back-end integrations that we have built into the product. And you can see that we support some of the social networks if they just want to, um, you know, they want something on their Facebook about Coolidge and Harding, they can do that. Um, <laughs> if you've taught the students to use Digo or Evernote as a bookmarking service, um, we can move this content directly into um, a clipping in Digo and in Evernote. Anybody familiar with EasyBid? So uh, we have a partnership with EasyBid where we'll actually populate the citation information directly into EasyBid and then they can create the citation. Um, we also um, support email, so if they want to email it to their email address and then when they get home they can find this information. Um, so all those, the, all those uh, sharing uh, functionalities are built into the product um, as well as um, an integration with um, Google Docs. So um, if you're logged into your Google account, um, you check off the results, and you can move the selected results directly into a Google document. And it carries the link along with it. And it drops the paragraphs that you've selected in the Google document. If students are working <coughs> together in collaboration in a project, they can all add you know, to, to the document as they go and they collaborate on the research that they find. No. No, it's going to carry, it'll take the paragraphs and the link, right? So the easy bit is, is different. That's, a, that's the citation aspect of it where they can um, move the content that they need for the citation right into the easy bit form and create a citation. Um, this is moving the content into a Google document for sharing in a group project or something where you could have you know, multiple students sharing the same document that keep, you know, 
you do the farmers and you know you get stuff on you know roaring twenties and you get stuff on the bio you know the, everything about Calvin Coolidge and we're going to combine it all in a Google Doc and we're going to write our paper. So all the students are going to be doing different activities and, and dumping things into a Google document to prepare their paper eventually. Um, so th that's uh, that's how it works on a search engine, right? Um, let's look at um, just a website real quick, so we'll uh, so you can see how it works. The sidebar itself can also be, um, you know, made smaller, bigger, whatever. So whatever website you're looking over on the right hand side, this happens to be an EPA site on um, greenhouse gas emissions. It has like 30 or 40 links in that particular site. It could be like a Wikipedia page. So I can um, I can go into here and say, uh, well, what I'm really interested in is um, <coughs> methane gas and its effect on greenhouse gas emissions. So you can manipulate this website and search behind all of those links for uh, particular information. Oh, if I lost my hand. So you get the idea. Website, a bunch of embedded links. Use your way, type in whatever terms you want. The more the better. We kind of look called looking for the Skittles, right? The paragraphs with the most colors might be the best ones for you to look at. Um, and, uh, and then move them and share them into um, other things. So that's the browser add-on, um, a free product, um, no charge, right? Uh, completely free, eight megabyte download, pretty simple. Um, you can get with your tech people. We have MSI files. They want to load it on the server and deploy it to you know, all the school computers. Not, not an issue. You can stop by our, our table if you need help or anything. There's a way to contact us through the website. Um, the other thing that's kind of interesting that we've just um, recently done is is also offer the technology. Um, we've exposed our API, our application programming interface, um, to actually put the technology into products, websites, blogs, um, to where the product doesn't need to be downloaded onto the actual machine. Um, you take advantage of Yolink technology um, in the cloud, and we deliver uh, the results directly to the website. So if there's any schools or districts or bloggers out there that want to add Yolink search to their sites, come see us or contact us through the website. Um, we're offering the technology to education folks for free. Um, it is a product that we license uh, commercially, but for the education market, it is completely free. This is one of our partners. Is anybody familiar with Sweet Search at all? Um, so this is a Google custom search engine. So what they've done is um, index, I think, up to like 30,000 uh, URLs. So similar to like site colon, they've gone after certain um, uh, content that they think is that has been vetted out by a team of uh, education folks that have said this is you know, good content. You won't have an Amazon book or Amazon link show up in any of the results because they don't they don't point their uh, search towards Amazon. Uh, so what they've done is um, they've actually added Yolink to uh, uh, to their search engine. So when I do something like uh, search for the causes of the Civil War. You're going to get from Sweet Search uh, something very similar to a Google search result, right? A bunch of links. Uh, they do bring their back the first three links from a, a sister company they have called Finding Dulcinea, which is a, a website with a lot of um, great content, articles that they write, articles that they commission to write. Um, and then underneath of it becomes you know, the rest of the searching from the Google um, a search engine that's going after just the index that's, that they're pointing at. And you can see over on the left hand side, there's a Yolink toolbar. So what you can do with this is, you know, you hover over here on the left hand side and the Yolink box pops up. So this gives you the ability now to, looking at the sweet search result links, now with this box I can manipulate or look inside all of those links for particular terms. So 
So I might really be interested in um, did slavery have a part of one of the causes of the Civil War, for instance. So now I might be that might be what I'm really looking for. And so when I click on find, your link's going to go into those results that Sweet Search brought back. And now I'm going to pull out paragraphs of content related to the word causes of slavery. These can be as many words as you want to type in. And this is a box that shows up that says, you know, hey students, you can share and all that kind of stuff. But that's going to pop up the first time they do that. So now as I scroll through, we can now look at the content without opening and closing a bunch of links. One last thing is that when they find a paragraph that does look interesting and they actually do want to go look at that website, these are live links. So when I click on them, for instance, we're going to bring up that particular website and we're actually going to take them directly to the spot of the website where the content is. We're going to box it for them. So if it's going to a large document or a large website, it's going to jump right to where the actual paragraph that they're looking for is. And in the sidebar architecture we looked at before, we do the same thing. If you click on that paragraph, we launch that website, take them directly to where it is. Uh, one more. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Uh, anybody use uh, Gutenberg?
you're all, you're all done. See this one? The rest of you, get going. Get going. Okay. So now I'm going to go a little bit quick. Uh, in fact, uh, just to show you some more tricks in, in Google. I, uh, you probably heard a lot of things at this conference that we should be teaching children global empathy. The triangle from Michael Wesch's presentation yesterday. I used to teach uh, the American Revolution nearby. I was a history teacher in Lexington, Massachusetts, which is not a bad place to teach the American Revolution. I'm going to go out and see it. But what I really need is I need my students to understand what they're doing in England. So just to show you the same approach we did with breast cancer, site colon ac.uk only gives me British universities. Now I'm going to use your link to go through British universities because the British, believe it or not, have a different version of what happened than we do. Yeah. No July 4th, no fireworks, <laughs> they don't call us patriots. Oh my gosh, do they have it wrong? They are so wrong. Any Brits in the room? You're just so wrong. We won that war. We're right in the telling. And, uh, but I'm convinced that if, if you put all this together, we really need to teach children that there are other points of view. In order to teach children that there are other points of view, it's essential to teach them that there are country codes embedded in web addresses outside the United States. UK is the two-letter country code of the United Kingdom. If I wanted to get um, JP and I was studying uh, Hiroshima, or World War II, then I would change all that to uh, uh, at ac.jp, and I might type in Hiroshima. Did I get that right? Stop me if I can't spell. But in any case, what we're looking at are only results in Japan, because AC is academic, JP are only sites in Japan. So very, very quickly, I think I'm going to give a different perspective on Hiroshima than the one paragraph in, in the history textbook. Now, in order to understand all of that, and I'm sure many of you do, so forgive me for you know, going over things that you know, um, we, we need to understand there's this concept called country code, like understanding the index of a book, and it's all on the internet, 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 domain, I could type domain, it's the same as the root zone database, and the root zone database will give me all the two-letter country codes, so that now I have this kind of alphabet of country codes, and I can zoom in on any one country when I'm doing research. That takes care of a lot of the mess. Uh, well, then I use your link on those, but I have to cut it down, um, in my opinion. A lot of kids don't know about the concept of country codes. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I just don't know. Uh, so I'm going to just keep going here. Is that OK? Yeah. I'll just keep going, and, 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 and you can buy my book down the hallway. <laughs> All right. Um, the, the, uh, the next bit, the one site that impresses students other than Yolik more than any other is um, a site I'm going to show you after I grab an article from my web page. By the way, a lot of this is written as well on my, our website. Under resources, we have a tremendous number of resources and in information literacy. If you want the notes for today, that they're all here. But for now, I'm just going to drop that to an article I wrote years ago, um, when I thought this was going to go in two years, called Teaching Zach. How many of you have read Teaching Zach to Think? Bunches of you. OK, so in Teaching Zach to Think, which I wrote in about 98, um, there it is. Um, I was, at the time, referencing this, this web address, which no longer has content available on the net because it's been removed. And sometimes there's a frustration level when you click on a, on a site and you get, oops, couldn't find or block, you know? And of course, as I bet many of you know, what you do is you grab the web address of any um, dead link it doesn't take you anywhere, and you go to the archive.org site, and then you hit the Wayback Machine, which is in the archive.org site, you erase the HTTP, paste the dead link, take me back, and the Wayback Machine has it 
tells you in this particular server, it came out in 2002 and left in 2006. I hit some recent version, and there's the content. So it goes back to 95. So any content that's been missing from the internet, that's been off of a server, you can't find it, we can find it. Now what makes this impression on children is I'll say, are you putting anything on your Facebook account? Or do you have a website? Are you putting up inappropriate pictures? Did you say mean things about a friend or complain about a job? Do you want to run for Congress one day or get a scholarship or I don't know? And is it possible that somebody might go to the web and find some content? This is before I tell them about the Wayback Machine. This is before, right? And, and a kid in the front row raises his hand and says, Mr. November, we're not that stupid. We're going to take it off the web before we apply for the scholarship. And I'll say, oh, really? And, and then I show them the Wayback Machine. I'll take something that's been off the web for 10 years and they'll say, well, have you heard of the Wayback Machine? And at that point, see, the kids were laughing at me. I thought I was stupid, didn't know you could take it off. And, and uh, at that point, no one's laughing. If you can watch an entire room of high school and middle school kids stop and go, what? Not my website. At that point, the only sound you hear is some kids hyperventilating. <laughs> Suck in air. I should bring little paper bags. Breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. But I think teachers should embed the, archive, the way, way back machine into an assignment. I think you should teach children that if you want to analyze a particular content, and, and many of you know this, so if I did you know, something like, um, uh, I, many of you know that the Martin Luther King website is owned by a white supremacist group with the address called martinlutherking.org. So I can take an existing site, in fact, just to, just to show you very quickly, um, we have, uh, whoop, as many of you know, do to do, www.martinlutherking. Does it say what it looks like today? Okay, there it is today. And uh, then I go to the Wayback Machine, and I click Take Me Back. And then I get all these dates starting in 99, because that's when it first appeared. And that's what it looks like in 99. So now I have the site in 99, and I have the site in 2010, or any other year. And what's fascinating, I'm not going to waste your time right now, but what's fascinating is none of that is on the site today. It's completely different. Different links, different photographs, different color scheme, uh, different headings. And, and in fact, what's really fascinating about the Wayback Machine, when you go back uh, to perhaps the very beginning of the website, so there's the two, um, but if I go back to this one and I drop down, it says that the webmaster is at Stormfront. That's gone today. So if I really want to dig deep, you know, whether I'm comparing uh, any organization that has had content on the web, on the same web address, I can analyze how they change their message over time. See, with War and Peace, it's War and Peace. <laughs> war and Peace not going to change tomorrow. It's going to be War and Peace. And, and, but the web is dynamic and changing. And so now we have to teach children a different way of thinking. You have to understand change of information over time to really understand what a politician is saying today. And if you don't know this, it's today. Way back machine. Okay. Uh, the next bit. Archive.org. Archive. Archive.org. Archive Archive and in the case I showed you, well, it's archive.org. Um, next idea is uh, Google for a second. Now, if I, um, in fact, if I do look at this Martin Luther King site, just to show you about links coming up, let me see if I get this. All right. So, if I really want to analyze any site, including my own, your school site, I think it's essential to take this link command and hit the, any web address. So I will hit uh, Martin. Luther King again, dot org. I just want to see 
how popular is this site? We've got links coming in. We've got 164 links coming into the site from other sites. I'm going to copy that just to show you how different search engines work, the comparison. Turns out Google is not a great search engine for that particular cross-referencing strategy. AltaVista is fantastic. So instead of 164 cross-links, AltaVista tells me there's 8,000. So Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf at crusader.net has a link to Martin Luther King. Fair enough? Right? And then I'm going to combine some other things. This host command does the same thing as site. I can limit in Alta Vista. It's the word host to limit to one extension, edu. So instead of the 8,000, I only want how many of those 8,000 are coming from higher ed? And I click find, and I see that there's 347 of the 8,000 are coming from higher ed. In that bit, Seton Hall right here, so hoax sites, just to show you what this looks like, on this page, if I drop down, I see that there's the link to Martin Luther King, and it says this is not a fun hoax site, but a hate site whose real purpose is veiled. Teachers and librarians need to be aware of this page. So now I have the benefit of commentary from higher ed, because I can see the, the university commentary on that site. But if I don't know how to cross-reference, I can't benefit from the university commentary. It's just me in the web. And so from there, we can get a little bit fancier. For those of you who like puzzles and, and you enjoy tearing the internet apart layer by layer, I, I told you Stormfront owns it. I can show you how I know that in a moment, but just for now, I'm going to take another web address called Stormfront, and I'm going to put another link in there. Link colon Stormfront, post colon limits it to higher ed, and uh, another link colon of Martin Luther King. So just to show you, these are going to be pages from higher education that have a link going out to two different web addresses. So if I click on Web Credibility Exercise, just to show you, State California, Bakersfield, that's the link to Martin Luther King right there, and that's the link to Stormfront right there. And this paragraph, of course, explains that the site might appear to be historic tribute to Dr. King, but in further examination, it's owned by the people who run the KKK. Now, without being able to cross-reference two web addresses back to only university commentary, I, I might not be able to figure this out on my own. Did, now, I know I just went really fast. I understand that. But I can't teach you in here anyway. I can only give you some quick views. We can teach children to tear apart the internet layer by layer. We can do this. And send them out in the world that's trying to eat them for lunch, by the way. And they don't even know they don't know. So with that, um, of course, some of you are wondering, how did I know that that was owned by Stormfront? And then a bunch of you do know. If I go to easywhois.com, easywhois.com, I want to know, is the public record available for the ownership of any domain? That would be a registration site like this one. And I type in martinlutherking.org, because I want to know who owns that site. And I drop down, and I see that uh, the martinlutherking.org website was created first on January 14th, is when it was granted license to have a URL. And it's owned by Don Black, and he's with Stormfront. So now I have what really is the equivalent of a title page of a book, but there is no title page on the web. The title page on the web sits on a different website. I have to leave this one to go over to Easy Who Is to figure out who owns this one. That's not hard. Just boom, boom. Got it. OK, I'm just going to kind of sum up so far. I have a feeling a lot of kids do not know how to find the owner of information. They, they don't know how to find content over time. This is a really important problem because they're putting content on the web themselves, and they think they can take it off. 
So that, that alone is worth the instruction on the Wayback Machine. Because uh, I've said to kids, girl in the front row, I said, do you understand what I'm trying to teach you? And she says, yeah, you're trying to teach us not to ruin the rest of our life today. And I said, yeah, that's right. Because what I wrote when I was 16 is rotting under a landfill. And nobody can find it. But your grandchildren will find what you write. And I think we should teach kids cross-referencing. I think we should teach kids that, that there's links between websites, and you can find the map, you can map them, and then you can say, well, only give me university websites linked to that thing where I can see university commentary. But if you send me out in the world where I can't cross-reference, and I can't dig through ownership, and, and I can't do some of these tricks, it's me and the web, right? The web's going to beat me. Web's going to beat your kids. They don't even know. They don't know. They think they're invincible. OK, so is my attitude OK? <laughs> attitude problems. And uh, so, well, sorry. This is my son's show. OK. Um, so to put it together a little bit more, um, and I have no time. Was I ending at 9.30? 945? Ah, good. Okay. So, going back to Google for a moment. I do believe that global empathy is the number one 21st century skill, I, my opinion. And, that, and there's no truth to that. That's just whatever your opinion is. So, don't worry. You have your own favorite 21st century skill. 